are in uh, the heart of First Thessalonians. And when I began First Thessalonians, I mentioned that First and Second Thessalonians, Paul speaks a lot about the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ. And last week we began this section, and there's actually two parts, and they, they fit together, but they're distinct as well. And I want to look at, uh, review quickly, what we looked at last week when we talked about hope. And we're looking at a specific thing that Paul was dealing with in the church. And again, uh, and I'll mention this again today, Paul gave them the basic doctrinal eschatology about the second return of Christ, about the resurrection of the dead, about everlasting life. That had been taught to them at salvation because it's crucial. It is a crucial part of salvation to understand the resurrection of Christ and how that impacts our lives here and now and for eternity. But there was a a few specific things that Paul is dealing with here. And the first one he talks about in verse 13 of chapter 4. And he said, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. And the key word there is hope there. And Paul is writing to give hope to the Christians who are grieving over Christians who have died. And again, there's a specific question he's dealing with here. But he talks about grieving like those who don't grieve like those who have no hope. And as Christians, we have hope. We aren't to ever take death flippantly. It is a horrible enemy, and we need to recognize that. But we don't have to grieve as those who have no hope. And the hope we have for life is the resurrection of Christ and the Bible. And I put both of those together. The resurrection of Christ is an objective truth that we know about even outside the Bible. There is, I believe, enough proof to prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. But how do we know that has any bearing on us? It's what the scriptures speak of, the resurrection of Christ and how that impacts our lives and that how it gives us hope. And again, when we talk about hope in the Bible, hope is not just something that we wish for. And I, I use the illustration but because it happened not too long ago. I've been ministering to God about six months in the jail, and he went to a parole hearing, and he was hopeful he was going to get out. And we talked about him possibly getting out and how we were going to help him and all this. Well, he went to the probation hearing and they rejected him and he went back to prison. And he had a hope that he was going to get out, but it wasn't this kind of hope. And after I talked to him afterwards, he said, well, you know, there was only about a 10% chance I was actually going to get out. But he was wishful thinking and preparing and all that. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is based on objective truth And the most important part of that truth is the fact that somebody conquered death, Jesus Christ, and he promises to take us with him when we die. And that's what our hope is based on. And again, that is a foundational truth that Paul had already taught the Thessalonians. He is here specifically dealing with another issue. And the issue is the Thessalonians are concerned that those who have died, and there's evidently some that have died over the last year, at least one or two, since Paul was there, are they going to get to participate in the second coming of Christ? This was a big deal to the church, and it should still be a big deal to the church. And so Paul is addressing that, and this is what he says in verse 15 and 16. He said, oh, I missed that. Uh, Go back. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, again, this is the objective truth that we have. Because Christ was raised from the dead, those who believe in Him will be raised from the dead. And again, this is what we believe as Christians. And it's something the Bible teaches us. But again, going forward, this is the answer that Paul gives 
to the question, will they get to participate? And he says this in the rest of the chapter. He says, let me tell you, that we tell you this directly from the Lord. In other words, he's got firsthand knowledge. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet a him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. In other words, what Paul is stating here, he says, the Christians who have died are going to be raised first, and they will meet the Lord, and we will all come together, and then we will come back. And he goes on and says this in verse 8, 16 through 18. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And so when we look at this passage, and we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 last week as well, we come up with this statement to help us to understand what Paul has taught us here. And that is that Christians who have died will be raised from the dead and we'll join Christians who are alive when Christ returns, and we will all be given new bodies that will never die. That is the truth we looked at last week, and that is definitive truth, and we need to understand that. But along with this, again, our great hope, and I concluded it with this last week, was that our greatest enemy, death, is defeated through Jesus Christ. And again, we need to recognize this enemy that is there. But that enemy has lost his power. That enemy has lost his sting. And as we looked at last week, for a Christian who dies, the terminology Paul uses there is they have fallen asleep, which is kind of cool. They just go to sleep and they wake up in Jesus' arms. And that is the hope and the comfort that God gives us with this. And Paul concluded this statement, this passage, last week. He said, so encourage each other with these words. Encourage each other with the words that I've given you. And again, as I mentioned, the Thessalonians, and I think it's foreign a lot with the people in the church today, they had a great anticipation they were enthusiastic and anticipating the return of the Lord. And they were always prepared to die. And that's the way we should be. We should live our lives with the great expectation that the Lord may return tomorrow in our lifetime. And if He doesn't, we are still prepared to die. And that is so important for us to understand that with our lives. And if we don't live with that expectation, I don't think we'll fulfill our purpose. C.S. Lewis said this, and it's one of my favorite quotes from him. And he said this probably 70 years ago. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, heaven, that they become so ineffective in this world. And I believe that this is a problem that still exists in the church. And this introduces us to the next part of the teaching on the return of Christ that Paul is teaching them. And again, they are similar, but there's a different emphasis in this passage we're going to look at today and how it should live and how it should influence our lives. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't need to write to you. And again, Paul begins this section by saying, I have already taught you this. It's already foundational truth that you know. And I really don't need to write to you. And again, like the resurrection from the dead that he talked about in the last section, he's stating that they understand basic truths about the end times but he continues to give some more information on it. And I want us to look at that further information that he gives there. And that's in verse 2 and 3. 
For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. Now, I don't know if this came to you as a surprise. This goes against so much of the rhetoric and what people believe about the return of Christ. I mean, when we look at this passage, we tend to look at, well, there are wars everywhere, and everything's in chaos, and everything's in turmoil, and the whole world's gone crazy. Christ is coming back. Is that what this says? No, that's not what this says. This says... When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall upon them. So what is Paul dealing with here, and who are these people? I think I can illustrate it with just one example that we ran into on Monday. Sherry and I took the day off. Monday's usually my day off, and we did the color run. And we went up to Telluride, and we love to ride the gondola in Telluride, and we're riding the gondola, and we, and we rode it with three different groups. The first was a couple of, of uh, mothers who had kids in school in Cortez, and they had run up there for the day just to get away. And the second was a couple, when we got to the um, mountain village, they got on the gondola with us and were riding down to town. And they had been up there for lunch, and they worked in town. And this young couple are in love. And you could tell they're in love. You know, and they're just oblivious to the world around them. You know, they, they don't even probably know there's election year going on. And I doubt they know anything about a war in Palestine or Ukraine. They're just living life, and they feel safe and secure. They've got good jobs. They're paying their rent every, every month. They have plenty of food. You know, they get to this weekend, they said they were going to go up, and they're camping out on Mola's Pass, and they went up there to cook hot dogs and watch the stars. You see, the world doesn't know there's impending danger of Christ's return. And he can come at any point in time in that scenario. And so they're feeling everything is peaceful and secure. And they don't realize that the Lord could come at any moment and disaster hit them. And so Paul is speaking to a lost audience on that level. That they don't understand this is going to happen eventually. And Paul is saying this is not the case when Christ returns. That disaster is going to come as suddenly as a woman who goes into labor and there will be no escape. Their time will come. Peter speaks of this group of people and I want to read this passage because it's an important passage in understanding the lethargy and, the, and people who are lost that don't prepare for the Lord's return. Look at what Peter says. This is a fairly long passage, but I just want us to read it together. He said, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. Now, first of all, I want to say this about the last days. When are the last days? We've been living in the last days for 2,000 years, okay? It is this time from the ascension of Christ till he returns. So this has been the case throughout history. But this is, the, I, uh, this is the mindset of the lost. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming back? From before the times of our ancestors, everything's remained the same since the world was first created. And so they're saying, you keep talking about Jesus coming back. And they are scoffing at the church. And this belief that we have that Jesus could come back at any time. And they're saying, everything continues as it has since the beginning of the world. And then he goes on and says this, But they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. 
And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. That, then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. So they are deliberately forgetting two major events. One is creation. This thing did not start by itself. God created it all. And God destroyed it all with a flood. And again, if you miss those two major events in history, you're not going to have a proper view of God or what's going to happen. He then goes on and says this, And by the same word, which word? That God created the world. The present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. So think about it this way. How long has it been since Jesus was ascended to heaven? About a couple days. See, we don't have perspective like God does. And we need to understand that. But he says why he hasn't returned in the next part as he concludes it. God, the Lord isn't really slow about his promises, some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Now again, I want to comment on this. What is the one definitive sign of the return of Christ. None others are definitive, but this one. What is it? The last person on earth has been saved. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. When the gospel has been preached to every people's, then he will come back. And that's what he's saying here. He is waiting until that happens, which I always, I've said this to you before. And I think it's important for us to understand that. If we want the Lord to get, come back quick, what do we need to do? Finish the job. We got work to do. But he concludes this passage like Paul did. But the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements and cells will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. So the world scoffs at the idea that Christ is going to return, and when he does, they're going to be caught off guard, and he will bring judgment. And so I want to give us two things that we can definitively say about what Peter and Paul says and the rest of the New Testament and all of Scripture about the return of the Lord. And I think these are important. And that is... The coming of the Lord is inevitable. It's going to happen. And to illustrate that, he talks about a woman going into labor. When a go woman goes into labor, and some of you women have had babies in here, when a woman goes into labor, what's going to happen next? She's going to have a baby. And you're not going to stop that. Okay? It's inevitable. And that's the illustration he uses here. But it's also unpredictable. When Christ comes, it will be like a thief in the night. And there will be those who look at the chaos of the world and are thinking, oh my gosh, is everything's falling apart? And then there's going to be others who say, this is cool. Life's good. See, that's what we need to understand in regards to this. But these passages also give a clear warning to unbelievers, and that is that Jesus will come back suddenly at an unexpected moment and bring judgment on the earth. And this is one of the things that should motivate us as Christians that we are sharing with our neighbors Christ. And if He does happen to come back during our lifetime, when we're alive, we have done our part and we have shared the gospel, and hopefully people are saved. So this is a clear warning for those who aren't Christian. But Paul contrasts Christians in how we are to be. In verse 4 he says this, But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. 
Now, why won't we be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief? Because we have this anticipation and expectation. We're living our lives with that expectation that it could happen at any moment if we're living the way we should be. You see, unlike the people of the world who don't know Christ, Christians know from the Bible that Jesus is coming one day and we won't be surprised when He comes back. He goes on and explains more about what it means not to be in the dark. Look at what He says in verse 5. You are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and night. Now again, oftentimes darkness in Scripture, and it's the meaning here. What does darkness and night reflect? What is he talking about? He's talking about ignorance. They're groping around in the darkness. They don't know what's going on. And evil. That's when evil takes place. And darkness is many times associated with evil, with sin. So again, we are not like that in the world. We're not groping around in the darkness, not knowing what's going on. And we're not giving ourselves to sinful lifestyles. And being children of the light, we understand the times that we live in. And again, what are those times? See, again, I have a lot of friends that say, well, this is the time. By the way, it's not about predicting when Christ is returning. That's not what we're supposed to do. And unfortunately, a lot of people say, well, this must be the time. You know how many people have predicted that in the last 2,000 years? There are people in every generation. How many of them have been wrong so far? See, it could be another millennium. It may be another 10,000 years before the Lord returns. But we live with that expectation that He may come back in our lifetime, in our day, and that we are to live prepared for this. And so, as Christians, we have been forgiven of our sins, and we're not living the licentious life of ignorance that the world is living in. And there's an expectation there. Paul gets into the heart of this passage in the next three verses of how we're to live as a result of this. And I want to look at those a little bit more in depth this morning. So Paul tells us, so be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert and clear-headed. Not is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. Now I want to expand on asleep here. Last week, again, we looked at fallen asleep referred to Christians who have died. That's not the case here. Asleep here literally means sleep. They're cuddled up in their cozy beds, and they're asleep oblivious that there is a hurricane outside that's about to destroy them. I don't know that anybody got caught that way with this last hurricane, but that was a devastating hurricane that hit parts of the United States. But they're just all cozy and and living their lives. They're living in rebellion to the Lord, doing whatever they want, feeling like it's okay, there's no problem here. I'm good to go. Again, this is the darkness we looked at in the previous verse. In the night. But that other part he talks about is there when drinkers get drunk. Now I want to say this, and I want to be clear on it. If somebody drinks alcohol, are they sinners? I hear both. (laughs) You know, the Bible never says you can't drink alcohol. Now, I'll say where it is a sin. Is it 18 or 21? It's 21 in in Colorado, isn't it? The legal age to drink? 21? Okay. So if you're under 21 and you drink alcohol, it's a sin because it's illegal. If you're over 21 and you get drunk, it's a sin. 
But if you're over 21 and you have a glass of wine or you drink a beer, I don't think God cares unless it's causing someone else to stumble. That's the caveat. And I say this with those that I work with in the jail. Because I was an alcoholic, because I got two DUIs, because I abused alcohol when I was young, it is a sin for me to drink. That's me. And that's why I haven't had a drink in almost 46 years. And I'll hopefully never have another drink. But if we go out to eat and my wife wants to drink a margarita or a daiquiri, or I think those are the two, I don't even know, and she wants to have a drink, she has her drink and there's no problem and it's fine. You understand the point here? See, a lot of Christians have this mentality, we become legalist. Is there danger in alcohol? Yes. But Jesus turned water into wine, and it wasn't grape juice. And so we need to be careful with this. But the point is, he's using this as an example When people get drunk is one example of living a rebellious lifestyle, not caring what other people think, not caring what God thinks, and living a selfish life before God. And he compares that with those who live in the light, and that is us. He says, first of all, be on your guard. Be on your guard about what? I think there are two things here. Be on your guard about the fact that don't get lulled to sleep and think that the Lord's not going to return and live like other people. And also be on your guard about the temptations of sin that are out there that can cause you to lose your testimony, lose your purpose, and you will not fulfill your tasks that you've been given to be here for. I think that's the issue here. He says, stay alert and be clear-headed. Now, the word clear-headed there in the Greek is the word sober, which is in opposition to being drunk. But here's the thing. How many drunks were in the church in Thessalonica? As far as I know, there weren't any. We don't have anything that Paul is sitting there, you know, chastising them for being a bunch of drunks. But it's about being sober living. What does it mean to have a sober lifestyle? It means, as, he's, as it's translated here, clear-headed, living a balanced life. And I mentioned this last week, and I want to re- re-illustrate it. Living a balanced lifestyle is planning for the future and investing in the future, in our children's children, as the book of Proverbs says, building a church that's going to be here for a hundred years, which I think we have one that will, Lord willing, and serving our communities and leaving a legacy and living a long life, expecting to die when we're 110 years old. That is about what he's talking about here. It's not given in to greed or licentiousness, or lust, or sexual sin. It's the things Paul talked about right before this passage in chapter 4, about living holy lives and making a difference in the world we live in. That's living a balanced life with the other expectation that before we leave here today, God could come back. Christ can appear. See, they're not contradictory. And I mentioned this last week. I have had quite a few church members over the last 25 years since I've been here are here on Sunday and they die before the next Sunday. It can happen. Sherry and I may have a car wreck today on the interstate going to Oklahoma and We won't be here next week. That's a possibility. And we live our lives with that expectation because we don't know. We don't know when our lives will end 
where the Lord returns. And it's having that clear expectation there. And I think that's what Paul is challenging us with. Living in both worlds at the same time. And he completes this passage here by talking about the armor of God. And this is the first time he's introduced this in Scripture. And in Ephesians, in about 10 years, a little over 10 years, Paul will give a further description of the armor of God. But here he uses it, and again, the reason Paul used it, it was a very good illustration for the time they lived. Everywhere Paul went, there were Roman soldiers. And Roman soldiers all had breastplates on. Roman soldiers wore their hats. And they had the other piece of the armor that you'll see in Ephesians. But here he just uses two pieces and he connects them to what Paul began his letter with. And you remember what it was? Faith, hope, and love. In Corinthians he says these are the greatest of all. Okay, these are the things that are important. And here he lumps faith and love together with the breastplate. And the breastplate does what? It protects your heart. It protects your internal organs from attack. And one of the things that reason that Paul brings a soldier's armor up is that we are always in a spiritual war. And I've used the illustration before. There's a lot of Christians that are clueless that there's a war going out there spiritually. You know, they're... They're like the guys that jumped in to Germany on D-Day or into France on D-Day, jumped into a farmhouse, and this literally happened. They landed in a farmhouse. They went through the roof, and they looked around in the farmhouse, and there was a stash of booze, and they sat there and got drunk. By the way, they got court-martialed as well. See, there's a war going on. What does that war look like? Well, that war is a war for our souls. See, the greatest enemy we will face is ourselves. Yeah, the devil tempts us, the world tempts us, but the greatest enemy we face is ourselves, and we need to be grounded in faith and love, which protects our heart. We don't give our heart to something that's not God, and it protects our emotions from all the things that will make us anxious or fearful or angry because we can easily live that kind of life. And so we put the breastplate of righteousness on you, and here it's the faith and love that protects us. And then he says, and this is the theme of the whole book of Thessalonians, is hope. He puts the helmet of salvation, and he says here, he calls it the confidence of our salvation, which I think is a great, illustri- uh, a great interpretation, but it's not a translation. It's the helmet of hope. See, we have this expectation of Christ's return that we're secure. We will not be part of the wrath of God when it comes, and we will be able to live our lives fully the way God wants us to. And so I think that the point Paul is making in this passage is this. Christians who are saved and have eternal life should not live like people who will be judged and condemned when Christ returns. That's totally different groups, isn't it? And we live our lives knowing that we're saved, knowing we will not be judged, And living a life is pleasing to God that's holy. He expands on our salvation. And it's interesting, this is the only place in either 1st or 2nd Thessalonians where Paul actually speaks to how we're saved. Look at verses 9 and 10. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out His anger on us. And again, the word there for anger is what? Wrath. Wrath. And the King James says we are not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. Now again, there are some 
that say, well, this means that we won't be there during the tribulation and it will get raptured out. And I don't dispute that. But that's not the point of this, is it? See, the point of this is we will not be judged when Christ returns. We will not be condemned. Because we have been saved. And he says, Christ died for us so that whether we're dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. Do you see the emphasis he's making there? It doesn't matter if we've already been in a grave or if we're here when he returns. We will be with him forever and we are not appointed to wrath. And so it's important for us to understand what Paul is saying here and also what he's not saying. And I'm not disputing anybody's eschatology here this morning. But the point is that we are not appointed to wrath because Jesus died for us. And we can trust that. And see, these wonderful truths, because we know these things, should encourage, comfort, and challenge us to live holy lives for the Lord. And Paul concludes this passage with the same words, almost exactly what he did in verse 18 with the first teaching on eschatology. Look what he says. So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you're already doing. Again, what did he say in verse 18? He said, so encourage each other with these words. In other words, as we look at the teaching of the coming of Christ, what should it do for us? It should encourage each other to keep going. Don't give up. Stay the course. It doesn't matter how bad things may look in your life. And by the way, were bad things happening to the Thessalonians? Yes. They were being persecuted and probably imprisoned, and probably ostracized from their families, probably losing their property, probably living destitute, like Scott is this morning. <laughs> Thanks, Don. That was a good illustration. But they were living very difficult lives. But they were to encourage each other. God's got this. Jesus is coming back. And it was the motivation for them to keep doing this. I want to conclude this morning outside of Thessalonians. When you look at Jesus' extended teaching on His return, and the most familiar passage of that is in Matthew 24. At the end of Matthew 24, when he completes the teaching, he gives parables. He gives parables about the wedding feast. Remember what Jesus said about the wedding feast? Go out in and invite those that are invited. He was talking about the Jews and the Jews didn't come. And he went out and invited everybody to come in. Anybody that wanted to, that is the gospel for all people. But one unfortunate soul showed up without the wedding garments. He wasn't saved when he showed up and he got cast into outer darkness. There's only one way to get invited to the wedding feast and be welcome. But he concludes with two other illustrations or parables. One is about the bridesmaids. Remember the story about the ten bridesmaids? All of them had lamps. And some of them had oil in their lamps and some of them didn't. And their way, they get called to go into the wedding feast. And the ones that didn't have oil wanted to borrow some from the ones that had oil. And they said, we don't have enough for everybody. And they ran home to get some more and they got back too late. What's the point? They weren't ready. They were not ready when the bridegroom came. The last parable that illustrates this is the parable of the servants. And this is the parable that Lane preached on back on Father's Day. And it has to do with the master left his servants in charge of his estate and he gave talents, he gave money, he gave resources to each one. And he says, you take care of my stuff till I return. 
Now, what's the illustration? That's an illustration of you and I. We are to be stewards of what God has given us. That's our time, our talents, our resources, our gifts. Everything we own belongs to Him. And we're to be using it for His glory and for His benefit and to build His kingdom. And Jesus said this, and I think this is where we should end today. He made this statement as a question. And it's in Luke chapter 18. When the Son of Man returns, who's the Son of Man? When Jesus returns, how many will He find on earth who have faith? Regardless of what your eschatology is, regardless of anything else, when Christ returns, are you faithful? Are you living a life of faith? Paul commends the Thessalonian church and says, you're already doing this. By the way, I mentioned this before. They were an example for all churches. They were getting it. Were they doing it perfectly? No. But they were doing it. So the questions that I leave with us this morning... Can we say that we have faith the way we're living right now? Are we living by faith? And are you ready to meet Him if He returns today? That's Paul's teaching in Thessalonians. It's living with that expectation that He can come back at any time and are we being good stewards and doing what we're supposed to when He shows up? And are we sharing that with those who for sure aren't ready when he comes back? As we close this morning, I want to challenge us. It's so easy to get lethargic on this, isn't it? It's so easy to be living our lives and not live with that expectation. Again, it's so easy to think, man, we've got lots of time. And many of us in here may have lots of time. But we don't know. And the key is, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing every day, knowing it may be our last? So I want to just encourage you and challenge you as you, we come to communion this morning. I want to encourage you to think about these things and pray about them. And then we invite you to come forward and take communion, and we will close our service together with that this morning. So I want to go back to Paul's words in verses 5 through 8. And the word I want to talk about is balance. So you can take a teaching like this morning and go extreme with it. You know, i got to cancel my trip to go see grandkids. I'm not supposed to do that because that isn't in line with my task. Or those of you that have been going hunting this fall. Or Scott starving up on the mountain camping this morning. Or, you know, we can do an extreme on this, can't we? And we can be so legalistic with it that we remove everything out of our lives. And people have done that. You know, they sold all their stuff and gave it away to the poor. And guess what? They didn't have anything and they were now starving. I think the key is, and I love Jesus' words, Are we being faithful? And I think the way we can judge this in our lives is if the Lord showed up today, would I be ashamed? Would I be unprepared? 
Will it be said, wait a minute, I need, I, I, was, I was planning to get this, I was, I was planning to serve you, Lord. I was, I was going to do those things. See, I think that's what the message is. Because guess what the Thessalonians were doing every day? They were getting up and going to work. By the way, Paul commanded they go to work. Remember? Just a few verses ago. They were working. They were living quiet, productive lives. And we talked about that. They were living their lives loving one another. We talked about that. Taking care of one another. In other words, they were living lives that were exemplary of people who loved the Lord and they weren't panicked about the world around them and they were being faithful. That's the way we're supposed to live. And as we live that life, we are loving our neighbors, we're loving other people, we're sharing the gospel. Sometimes we're going on mission trips. Sometimes we take vacations. Sometimes we go hunting. See, it's balance. And I think that's a word that we need to really look at our lives. To be sober-minded and live balanced lives. Not given to sinful lifestyles. That is always a no-no. But also, not living our lives that we're People, when they see us, they go, oh, they're so weird. I can't stand to be around them. And let me give another illustration. I really wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to. So on the way back, when you do the gondola ride, you have to get off at the bottom and then get back on. And we didn't have time because we had to get back to Ignacio. And so we just got off and got back on. And they were busy. And so two women about our age got on the gondola with us. And they were from Dallas. And we were visiting with them. And I mentioned that First Baptist Dallas had burned. And they acknowledged that. And I talked about, you know, I'd gone to college there. And they asked me where. And I told them Criswell College. Well, it, it felt like a real safe place for them. And so they started talking about hoarding food, getting ready for what's about to happen, and... And I, just, and I just kind of tried to broach the gap about not being living an idolatrous life, which when I use that word here, you guys understand. You get it. And one of them immediately got defensive. Well, you don't understand what it's like to live in a city. You don't understand. You don't understand. And boy, she just went off. And by the time we got to the top, I wanted to run. And we got off the gondola, and she followed us and kept on and kept on. And, and we're needing to get to the car and get to Ignacio. And it's like, let us out of here. <laughs> and we reflected on that on the way home. Here were two Christians. And of the three gondola rides we had, one of them actually grew up Marbley's, one of the women that lived in Cortez, and we talked about Ignacio and, and, and just had a very pleasant conversation with them after the gondola ride. And that young couple, I wish we'd had longer to visit with them. We were enjoying their company. And I couldn't wait to get away from those women. Do you understand why the illustration is important? If people are running away from us because we are fearful or angry, and both of those, this woman was angry and fearful. She wasn't angry at me. She was just angry. See, that's not faithful, is it? See, God wants us to be faithful, trusting Him, not anxious, 
Loving your neighbor, whoever our neighbor is. And when Jesus comes and we're living that life, we won't be ashamed and he'll welcome us. Now again, we can't do that in our own. That's why we need the armor of God. We need the Holy Spirit to help us not be anxious, not be angry, not be fearful. To be loving one another and giving to one another, not living selfish lives. And that's what Jesus came to do. And because Jesus died for us, we don't have to be any of those things. And that's the reminder when we celebrate communion. Jesus said, this is my body. This represents my body that died for you because you've not been appointed to wrath. You are not have to be anxious about the things to come. Let's eat. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant. That new covenant promises us that when Jesus comes, we're his. And he has us till then. Let's drink. So before we close this morning... We have a family that is their last Sunday in our church today, and we're going to miss them. We've watched their children being born here, where well, they got married here, and, and, but Michael and Liz Rowe will be moving to Nebraska, uh, and next week they're going to be packing up and starting that process over the next few weeks. So I want to ask Liz and Mike and Mary and Tabitha if y'all would come forward, and uh, I want to ask the two elders we have here, Bo and Jared, to come up. And we want to we just say goodbye to you and pray for you as you're about to uh, embark on a new adventure and a new journey. And there are places for sale here, so if you know anybody wants to buy a place, they have it listed. You can find it on Zillow. It's Yellow Brick Road. And, uh, but they're trying to sell their place. They already have a place in Nebraska and we are going to miss you guys. But I know this is the next stage of your lives. And we love you guys. And it's been a joy for you guys to be in the church. How many, how many years have you been here, Liz? Thirteen. Thirteen? Mm -hmm. How many years have you been here, Mike? Do you know? Do you remember? <laughs> Somewhere about that as well. And so uh, we've had you for a long time. And you've been faithful members. And we love you. And. We just want to pray for you as you go off and venture into the new thing that God has for you. So I'm going to ask the elders to pray, and then I will close this. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Mike, Liz, and Tabitha, and Mary, for all the time that we got to have with them in this church, Lord. And we just pray for wisdom and safety and, and just new journey, this new part of life goes for them, Lord, that they know we will miss them, and just guide them and lead them as this next chapter in life comes to them, Lord, and may you just help them find another church home, and just be in their lives, and as we go forward, we will see them from time to time, but we will miss them, and just give them that, the strength, and Whatever they may need going forward, Lord, we, we will miss them and just hand them off to you in this next chapter. Father, we pray for Mike, Liz, Tabitha, Mary. We pray that as you uh, um, take them on to a new place, Father, that you would just uh, call them to continue to live in your word, continue to, um, God, not just live in your word, but teach your word to others, that you might call them to be uh, missionaries of sorts in their, their own way. Um, to where they're going as they uh, go on this next journey in their lives. And Father, we pray that we would just continue to, um, they would continue to feel, feel free to reach out to us in, in case of their needs spiritually, 
um, and, and other needs that they may have, Father. And we pray that you would just continue to bless them, that you would continue to, um, God, just just pull them close to you through another church, through another godly church who, who knows you. And um, God wants to see your love uh, and your word taught throughout the land. Father, in this time, I, I pray for them. I pray for safety for them as they're going to be making several trips back and forth to Nebraska. I pray as they pack that they will pack the things they need to take and leave the things behind they don't. And I pray, Lord, that uh, their house here will sell and that, Lord, as they settle into Nebraska, uh, they'll be prepared for the winter when it comes and they'll be uh, comfortable. And I just uh, also pray, as we've already prayed, Lord, that you would help them to plug into a new church home where they will be able to minister and be effective and fill their role in their gifts and talents. And, and I pray for them as they raise Mary and Tabitha. May they raise them uh, to know you and to follow you with all their lives. And I just pray that you would continue to help Michael and Liz and Mary and Tabitha grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and live lives that are pleasing to you in everything they do. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close with our benediction. Y'all just stay up here and help me with a benediction this morning. <laughs> <laughs> May the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God bless you. Bo's preaching next week, and we'll plan on seeing you in a couple of weeks. I think he's preaching on the Nephim. <laughs>